We're going to read one verse tonight. There, I'll be uh, talking about some other verses. Uh, but Proverbs chapter 22, if you will. Proverbs chapter 22, and just one verse uh, to start us out tonight. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. By the way, what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight is not original. Um, and I always, if I use other folks' material, I definitely do not want to um, have copyright issues. So uh, I will let you know that this is uh, some, some material that I got uh, from Dennis Rainey. Um, and uh, he and his wife have done a lot of uh, family-type uh, books and that kind of thing. And so this is from him. Uh, at least uh, quite a bit of this is. Some of this is not, but some of it is. Um, so I wanted to give him credit for that tonight. Uh, we're talking about focusing on the family, and particularly tonight, we're going to be looking at, at two areas of children. Number one, we're looking at adolescence and um, at youth. Okay, so those are, those are the two categories we're going to be looking at tonight. And we're going to do this in just a minute. This is just kind of a little fun thing uh, for some of us that may not uh, understand text language. Uh, we're going to look at a few illustrations of that and actually going to give you an opportunity to see if you can guess what they mean. Now, I know we've got some that are here. You guys, I know all the younger people are probably going to be like, I know all those things. And so don't, don't give it away, okay? Uh, we're trying to get some of these adults to kind of understand and maybe try to guess what some of these things are. So uh, if you are a text-savvy person, you're probably going to know some of these, but some of them you're not. By the way, we're not doing LOL. Everybody knows what that is, right? Laugh out loud. We're not going to look at those. Those are too easy. All right. Um, so I want to look at, this is, this is a book, or comes out of a book that um, Dennis Rainey um, wrote, and it's called Lessons from the Rainey Preserve. Now, he is actually... He's actually taking an illustration about animals, and he's um, kind of correlating it to teenagers, okay? Now, it, it's kind of funny, but anyways, it, it, just, just listen. Um, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, the Bible says this, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. When you train a child up in the way that God would have you to train them, that is something that will stick with them from now on. Now, I'm not saying just because you teach a child the right thing, they're always going to do the right thing because we know they're not. They make mistakes, just like all of us do. And uh, so, anyway, but the Bible says that if you will train up a child in the ways you go, he will not depart from it. That is, that knowledge that you've given them will stick with them the rest of their life. And so that's an important thing to remember. Now, I want to start by, by reading what... Uh, Dennis Rainey wrote here. I want you to bear with me because I think this is really good. It said, teenagers are causing huge problems in one section of South Africa. They are running wild in the untamed bush and are creating havoc with wild animals in a, in a popular game reserve near uh, Pilliansburg. According to Los Angeles Times report, the teenagers have killed rhinos, charged cars on safari goers, cars of safari goers, and even killed one German businessman who was rescuing his toddler who had fallen out of the car window. Now, I know you're probably getting where this is going, right? You're thinking, this is not a teenager. This is not a person. This has got to be something else, and it is. Um, who are these adolescent bullies? Transplanted teenage orphans, young male bull elephants, okay? So these are young teenage bull elephants that are causing this havoc. And it says this, over the past few years, zoologists transplanted, transplanted a number of juvenile elephants to Pelliansburg that had been abandoned in another game park. No older elephants existed in Pelliansburg to help raise the younger ones. According to the reported uh, young, the, I'm sorry, according to the report, the young bull, bulls were coming uh, into maturity 10 years earlier than normal and the effects of their broken home life are becoming dangerously apparent. Rebuffed by older elephant cows, some teenage bulls have taken uh, to mating with white rhinos. Several rhinos have been killed in the process. Other young bulls are taking out their aggression on people, charging groups of tourists. To solve the problem, the authorities introduced a half dozen adult bull elephants, all more than 40 years old. 
one zoologist said, hopefully the adult bulls will put these young elephants in their place. Uh, in the six months that followed, there were no reported incidents with rhinos or tourists. Think about that. Now, I know that we're talking about animals, but still, as we look at our society today and we see the degradation of the family and we see that there are homes where there's no fathers, there are homes where there's no mothers, and the children are not being able to be uh, raised up with a two-parent family, and sometimes because there's not fathers in these families, then there are, there are issues uh, with children just because of that. And there are a number of other reasons as well. Um, though we have never supervised the rearing of teenage elephants, he said his wife and himself are in the process of raising our fifth and sixth teenager. And we can affirm the initial findings in South Africa. Teenagers need parents to be involved in their lives. And that is so true. But you know what we do? A lot of times, when we think about young people, we think about teenagers, parents become so upset with the kids, they just don't want to deal with them, and so they kind of push them out there to leave them to raise themselves. And that is not what our society needs. Even our churches today, we need parents who are involved in their kids' lives that are training them, that are nurturing them uh, in the admonition of the Lord. It is, it's true in our home, and it was true in King's da King David's home. Consider the arrogant and rebellious son of King David, which was uh, Ad Adonijah. In 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 6, we find a clue to why Adonijah ran wild. Speaking of Adonijah, the scripture says, and his father, talking about David, had never crossed him at any time by asking, why have you done so? In other words, David had never came to him and said, why are you doing what you're doing? This is the wrong thing. You don't need to be going this direction. He never crossed him in that manner, and therefore, Adonijah did what he wanted to do. David's mistake. He did not let his son know when he had stepped across boundaries. And folks, our kids today need boundaries. You know, one of the cool things when I was growing up, by the way, now, obviously, I make my own choices. But when I was growing up, if I ever got to the point where, like, some kids at school wanted me to do something that I know mom and dad were not pleased with, then, you know, I remember saying this over and over again. Guys, I can't do that. And they would be like, well, why not? And I said, because my parents said I could not do that. You see, that was an out for me. And see, what happens is, when there are boundaries in kids' lives, whether it's this kid, this little kid, or whether it's a teenager, when you set boundaries, and there are costs when you step over those boundaries, children understand, I can't do this. And I guarantee you, if I had stepped over some of those bounds my parents had set for me, and I tried several times, my parents let me know, you crossed over the boundary. And they did it many times by spanking or by grounding me or whatever it is that it took for them to do. And folks, I'm going to tell you, I respect that today. When I look back on my life, I don't, I don't have bitterness toward my mom and dad for setting boundaries for me. I thank them for setting those boundaries. And folks, we've got to set boundaries for our kids today. We are not their best friend. I know that a lot of parents try to think, oh, I want to be my kid's best friend. Well, you can be their best friend, but you're first their parent. And you have got to understand, they've got to understand that there are boundaries that you have to set for them. And if they go over those boundaries, then there are, there are repercussions of that. Um, and so David did not set boundaries for his son. Obviously, David's error does not excuse his son's rebellion, but it contributed to it. In fact, his son's rebellion may have been resulted, may have even resulted with Adonijah pushing David out of his life. You ever know teens that do that, that kind of push their parents out of their lives? I counsel with people all the time. These are kids that have now grown up, and they're still having problems because of things that happened in the past, and because they were rebellious toward mom and dad, and that relationship between mom and dad is strained. It was just this week I talked to somebody about that. And so we, we have to understand that uh, we need to set boundaries for our kids. After years of managing the rainy game preserve, this is back to, to where um, uh, the rainies are at here, Barbara and I have learned the following lessons. And these are some lessons that I wanted to share with you that I thought were really good uh, about um, 
uh, how you need to, to give these lessons to your kids. Number one, your teenager, your teenagers need you to prayerfully stay involved in their lives and ask questions. They don't always welcome you to ask questions, but ask them questions. Ask them when they went to bed. Who are they talking to on the phone? Who are they chatting with on the internet? Folks, that's one thing we're going to look at just a minute about the texting stuff, because it is just amazing to me what some of the language, uh, by the way, I didn't put the bad language up here, and there's plenty of it, okay? And I'll give you the website if you want to look at it later, if you want to check up on what your kids are texting. I'm telling you, some of this stuff, I'm just like, oh my goodness, it blew my mind. You know, I see, matter of fact, I see that kind of stuff on Facebook and on other places where I didn't know what it meant. You know, they put this, uh, well, anyway, they put a bunch of letters together, and I was like, I don't know what that means, until I looked at this website, and I'm like, wow. You know, so it's important that we, we need to prayerfully stay involved with our kids' lives. I remember this. When I got home, when, when I was out with friends, when I was a young person, when I was a teenager, didn't matter who I was out with, didn't matter if it was the preacher's daughter, which I spent a lot of time at the preacher's house, uh, because he and uh, myself and his daughter were like brother and sister. We grew up from nursery together all the way up. And so we're all, didn't matter whether I was at the preacher's house or whether I was at somebody else's house, mom and dad always checked up on me. Let me, let me share this with you. I, I honestly, when I was a younger teenager, 15, 16, when I first got my license, I thought my mom knew everything. I mean, literally everything. I thought she had this um, ESP, whatever you call it. Is that what you call it? Extrasensory perception. I thought she was like, she knew everything. And I'll tell you why. Because, uh, and she didn't share with me until a lot later in life, the story about this. But I was out one day. I was heading to Tuscaloosa. Mom and dad lived on the other side of Birmingham, so I was driving to Tuscaloosa. I was going to see my aunt, who lived in Tuscaloosa. I had a nice sports car, a very fast sports car, and so I'm going down 59 Highway, and there's another, I had a 280Z, Nissan 280Z, and back then that was a pretty fast car, not compared to cars today. But, so I'm on the interstate, 50, I-59, I've got my tunes cranked up, I mean, I had a, my boom box going, I mean, it was just really, you know, and, you know, had the song on I Can't Drive 55. You know, some of y'all remember that song. Anyway, I'm driving down the interstate, and this other 280Z pulled up beside me, and, of course, he's kind of sitting back, you know, kind of looking like he's got, did like this right here. That means he wants to race. So I sh downshifted to second gear, and I blew by him, just blew past him. I'm up way too fast, by the way, and I won't tell you how fast I was going, but the car will do 160, and I was not too far away from that, okay? So I'm flying down the interstate, and, you know, I thought, man, I, I, I just blew this guy away. I am tough stuff. I get a phone call. And my mom said, where are you at? I was like, well, I'm just driving down to see, you know, Renee, my Aunt Renee. And my mom said, you're driving too fast. I mean, it just, I was like, oh, my goodness, how did she know that? She never said until probably 15 years later she told me that it was because a friend of hers saw me driving down the interstate flying down the interstate and called her and let her know. But here's the thing. You know, my mom could have said, oh, you know, boys will just be boys. Listen, I got grounded for a long time because of that. I mean, that she was not happy. My dad was not happy. And so um, got my car taken away for a little while. Uh, but anyway, there was a repercussion. And you know why? Because my parents cared about me. They were involved in my life. They prayed for me every day. I can't tell you how many times I came home from being somewhere with not somewhere, but with some people that I, mom and dad, really didn't want me to be with, and they were down on their knees praying for me when I walked in the door. Now, I don't know whether they were looking out the door thinking, all right, he's home, now let's get down and pray for him so that he'll feel bad when he walks in the door. I don't know, but I'm going to tell you, I bawled my eyes out many times coming home because I realized I was with somebody mom and dad didn't want me to be with. So they were involved in my life. And guys, I'm telling you, I am not trying to boast of myself because I'm not, or of my brother, but I'm telling you, you do not raise good, godly Christian men or women by accident. It is, you have put some things into place, you have put some safeguards into place, you prayerfully involved in their lives, but also, number two, um, your teens need you, to, uh, need you to persevere when they push you out of their lives. You see, Many times, teens will simply say, I don't want you in my life. You're in my space. Get out of my space. And a lot of times, parents will simply back away. But the truth of the matter is, 
They need you in their life. They need you to continue to be in their life. And do not isolate yourself or let them isolate themselves. Be involved, persevere, be involved in their lives, but also uh, they need you to be in their lives believing in them. The teenage years are clouded with self-doubt and insecurities. The social pecking order in junior high and high school can be brutal. Your teens need you to, cre to create a harbor in the storms um, of life and hang tough with them. That's what they need for you to do. You may have, pa have to pause for a moment and think, but you can find a way to express your belief in your child. Write them a letter. Leave it on the pillow. One of your jobs as a parent is to keep hope alive and you do that by being involved and by believing in your children. You know, one of the things that I, I really believe that is important in a teen's life, not only that there are repercussions when they do wrong, but folks, we've got to learn to give praise when praise is due. As a matter of fact, there's a, a saying, you raise what you praise. Okay? So, and sometimes you need to go overboard on the praise part because the truth of the matter is there's a whole lot of repercussions that have to happen because of some things, that choices that they make. And so you feel like you're all the time talking that, down to them or, or giving punishments to them. And so look for opportunities to give them praise. But then number four, you need to be, I'm sorry, your teens need you to be involved and help them establish boundaries in their lives. God has given you the assignment of drawing lines and boxes. Who they can hang out with, who they can't, where they can go, when they need to be home what movies they can watch, what they can wear. I'm going to tell you folks, that is huge. Who they are hanging around, what they wear, the movies they watch, those things are so important. And we need to be involved in our kids' lives when it comes to stuff like that. Number five, your teens need you to be involved in their lives doing battle over sin. And even the best of teenagers, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Prayer is your most powerful weapon. And tough love is a close second. After you've prayed, don't hesitate to call sin what it is in your child's life. Make them understand, help them understand, this is why I have to do what I have to do. I remember a couple of times when Megan was little and we had to discipline her. One of the things that we always tried to do is say, Megan, do you know why you're having to be punished? Do you know what you did that's causing us to have to punish you? You need to let them know, not just angrily whoop your child just because you want to do it. You need to let them know why they're being punished. Sin is deadly, it is dangerous, it destroys, it cripples lives. I want to give you an illustration and then we're going to move on to something else. Um, some of you heard this before. I think I may have given it a couple years ago. But I had a friend in college. And this friend, uh, he was kind of a wild child, if you will. Uh, during his teenage years, he was a very, very wild person. He went out every weekend, he did drugs, he got drunk every weekend, he spent time with his partying with his friends, and Stephen is his name. Um, Stephen got drunk one day, was a little bit high on some stuff too, but he was also drunk, and they go out, you've heard this, some of you, they went out to this meat packing facility, and by the way, this guy's father was an IBM executive. This is way back in the day when IBM was just like, it was the um, industry, if you will, when it comes to computers and that kind of thing. And so this guy was an IBM executive. Didn't pay his child any attention. He gave him everything he wanted to get, he wanted. Um, by the way, I got a really good deal on a 60, 69 Mustang Fastback because his son, he bought it for his son and his son didn't even want it. And so anyway, that's another story. If you want to hear that later, I'll tell you about it. But, um, but his son pitched a fit because he bought in that car because he wanted something else. And so rather than saying, oh, son, you're going to drive that one, he went and bought him what his son wanted. So that kind of gives you an idea. Everything the kid wanted, his, his father gave to him, except his time and attention. His dad never had time for him. It was always like, go see your mother for this or go see your mother for that. So anyway, his son rebelled. He's out partying one night. He goes to this meatpacking company. By the way, it's a closed meatpacking company. They break in, they're, they're messing around, and they're over this big area that was used to like chop meat up, and it had blades and all this stuff in there that would turn and chop the meat up into hamburger and that kind of thing. And so they're walking on the edge, you know, seeing who can go across without falling while well, he fell in. He ended up having to have, when I met him, he had already had 10 surgeries. 
because of everything that had messed up. He, he literally walked like this because his leg had been cut into several pieces. His face had a big scar down it where one of the blades came across his face. His face was drawn down like this because of that accident. Just, and this is a guy that was a very athletic guy, seemed to have everything going for him. But you know what? The father did not set, the father or the mother, for that matter, did not set boundaries and say, this is the way you're going to live your life. These are the rules that you're going to abide by. And so he thought he could get away with anything. You know what he told me one day in college? He said, Dwayne, if I could go back and I could do things over again, he said, I would have never taken the path that I took. His parents told me, because we went to church with them, his parent, his father, told me one day, Brother Wayne, if I could have only gone back and set those boundaries for my son, I would do it in a heartbeat. But he can't. These are repercussions that happen because of a mom and a dad that did not set boundaries for their children. And so it's important that you be involved in your children's life, that you set boundaries for them. Folks, I want to tell you, it was so easy for me when I was a kid to say, I can't do that because mom and dad said I can't. And that was my way out. But you know what happened? It got to the point where I, wasn't, I was no longer saying, I can't do that because mom and dad said I couldn't. It wasn't long before I was saying, I can't do that because I don't want to displease God. And so there was a transition there. And so it's important. Set boundaries uh, for your kids. Now, um, I'm going to very quickly give you this. These are seven great priorities for parenting. Seven priorities for great parenting. Number one is prayer. How many of you who have children, don't raise your hand, but I want you to think about this. How many of you that have children, how many of you pray for your kids? And I'm not talking about um, God bless them with their homework today. I'm talking about praying for them day after day, moment after moment. Every time that your child comes into your mind, you are praying, maybe not out loud, but you're saying, God, I want my children to follow you. God, I want them to do right. I want them to make right choices. God, help them today in their school, not just in their schoolwork, but help them to make the right decisions, help them to follow the right kind of people, have the right kind of friends. I mean, we need to be praying those kind of things for our kids. And by the way, the Bible says that we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I believe not only that has to do with marriage, but I believe it has to do with those people that you closely tie, that you closely tie yourself with your children, they need to be a witness. But folks, I'm going to tell you, their closest friends ought to be people that know the Lord. They really should. Because if not, then those children are going to influence your children in a way that you don't want them to. And so it's important that you make sure your kids um, have got good Christian friends. So you pray for them. Pray regularly. Um, pray offensively. Offensively, I should say. Uh, before and after your child hits adolescence, pray for his peer group that he or she will have at least one strong Christian person that they can, they can count on as their friend during their teenage years. Ask God to protect your child daily from others who will be an evil influence. Also consider asking God uh, to help you spot your child doing things right so that you can encourage uh, them in making right choices. Not only pray offensively, but pray defensively. On more than one occasion, um, you, need, or you should on more than one occasion seek the Lord's help in removing a questionable character of a friend. In other words, a friend of questionable character. I should have said it right. Folks, I'm going to tell you, my mom, I know over and over again, because she told me she prayed about some friends that I had. And you know what? It wasn't long before those friends were out of my life for various circumstances. But folks, pray that your kids will have the right kind of friendships. And if need be, pray that if there are some unhealthy friendships there, that they will not be anymore. Uh, pray with your child. It's easy uh, for prayer to become an exclusive dialogue, you and God. Why not um, do what one mom, uh, this mom's name is Nina, did with her teenage daughter Natalie and become prayer partners? Wouldn't that be cool? You know, we all need prayer partners. Why not pick a son or a daughter to be your prayer partner and pray with them every day? Um, pray together as a family. Pray together as a couple. But number two, instill standards in your kids. That is, there are reasons why we do and we don't do the things that we do and the things that we don't do. 
We are children of God, and there are decisions that we cannot make, or that we, there, there are decisions that we cannot do because of the fact that we are um, children of God. Think about this. Have you set standards for your children? And what I mean by that is, have you talked about dating? I know some of you got little kids. But you know what? It's never too soon to talk about dating with your husband or your wife because it's going to come sooner than you think. It really will. So talk about with your spouses. Talk about dating. Talk about driving. You know, at what point are they going to get their license? And folks, it doesn't have to be 16 years old. Okay? Uh, I've got a friend that his mom and dad didn't let him drive until he was 20. <laughs> so anyway, it's because of insurance purposes and he was too wild, that kind of thing. Um, so, all right, talk about jobs. Talk about when your kids get old enough to, to get jobs as teenagers. How are we going to do this? Are, they, are we going to let them work here or there, whatever? Um, talk about grades. Talk about curfews. Talk about friends. Talk about school activities. These are decisions that you're going to have to make, and you know what? It's better to make them when your kids are younger and you can talk about it rather than being reactive. It's like, well, what are we going to do now? Are we going to let them drive? Are we going to let them date? You should have already talked about that years before. we got these things set already. These are things we've talked about. These are things we're going to follow through. But number three, involvement. We're not suggesting that you become the ultimate soccer mom, okay? That's not, a, that's not bad being there with all your child's activities, but involvement means much more than driving to carpool and never missing a, a dance recital. Involvement means crawling inside your child's head and inside their heart. Involving, involvement is moving from the outside of the, uh, to the interior of the child's life. That is, get involved with them, understand where they're at emotionally and spiritually. Involvement means diving into the turbulent currents caused by emotions the child and the parents, soul to soul, heart to heart. One of the things that I loved about my mom and dad is my dad was always there as much as possible when it comes to my ball games and stuff. But you know what? My dad was always asking me, hey, Dwayne, what's going on in your life? You know, what are you feeling right now? What are you thinking? You thought about the future? What are you going to do here? What are you going to do there? And my dad was always involved, not just physically being there for me, but emotionally being there for me. And same thing with my mom. It's so important, involvement. Number four, training. The best parenting is proactive, not reactive. All right? It is proactive, not reactive. A reactive parent stays in a defensive posture, continually reacting to a child's mistakes. But a proactive parent goes to the offense and does what is necessary to become the child's trainer. Effective training involved, involves at least three parts. First, uh, parents need to see the goal clearly. They need to know uh, what they are, are trying to achieve in their child's life. Second, effective training involves uh, repetition. Uh, a Green uh, Beret once told this fellow writing this book, as Green Berets, we train to learn what to do in every conceivable circumstance over and over and over again. Then in times of battle, we know what to do. It's just second nature to us. Folks, we need to, as parents, we need to learn those kind of techniques about not being reactive but proactive when it comes to different scenarios that may happen in our kids' life. <laughs> Number five, community. We have become increasingly convinced and alarmed that one of the most damaging changes has occurred in recent years is the loss of community and raising our children. We used to look out for the children of others far more than we do now. This type of involvement is rare today. In our age of tolerance, we have developed the philosophy that we have no right to tell another parent about a concern that we have about his or her child. And our children suffer from failure to be involved in the lives of others. It's important. Community is important. But then number six, direction. We have found that most Christian parents desire more than anything else to raise children that will grow up to love Jesus Christ and walk with Him. With that overall objective in mind, we search the Scriptures to discern what biblical goals that we should aim for our children. The four qualities... Uh, that we developed gave us four clear goals to pursue as we molded our children. Nearly every issue or trap our children were, will encounter uh, could be linked to a young person's need in one of four areas. Number one, identity. Every person is born with a unique, divinely imprinted identity. Number two, character. From Genesis to Revelation, character development is a major theme in God's work and God's people. Number four, or number three, relationships. 
None of us was intended to make a journey through life alone. We need the encouragement and the strength and the comfort and so forth from those around us. And then number five, mission. Every person needs a reason to be alive. Every child needs to understand God has a purpose for their life. Your child, every child that you have, every child in this world, God has a purpose for their life. And they need to understand that. You know what? I guarantee you, if they understood that more, we would have less children going out and committing suicide like we do. And folks, we're seeing it all the time. It's like they're, they've given up. There's no hope. And because of that, they're ending their lives. It's not just adults anymore. We saw recently where a child took their own life. If we give them purpose, God has already given them purpose. We just simply need to relay that information to them and help them understand that. But they have a purpose. They have a mission that God has for them. And then the last thing is perseverance. Parenting is not a weekend project. It's not like, oh man, we got to pass this hump. I'm done with my job. Folks, parenting is an ongoing process. I still, my parents still parent me. They still talk. I know some of you are like, yeah, I know what you mean. My parents still call and talk to me and say, well, you know, you might want to think about this or you might want to do that. I used to think my parents didn't know a whole lot. I have learned that they know a whole lot more than I thought they did. Uh, the older that I get, the more that I understand my parents know. And so perseverance, do not give up um, on your children. Make sure that you train them the way that God wants you to train them. Now, I want us to, um, one of the big things about children, about teens particularly, is media and the influence that media has on them. And so... Um, I want us to look just for a few minutes. I actually, I'm going to step back here where you guys are at and maybe, well, you know what? I need to stay over here because I don't think it's going to reach. Um, there are several, text messaging is huge today. And um, how many of you adults text message? Raise your hand. Okay. All right, don't lie now. Okay. Uh, a lot of adults do. But you know what? There's some language that we don't understand. Some of these abbreviations and stuff like that, we don't necessarily understand about our kids. And so what I want to do, this is kind of a little fun thing. I wanted us to look at some of these things. Don't worry about the bullet point. That's not a symbol, okay? The bullet point on the far left, that's just a bullet point. But what does this say right here? Somebody tell me. Huh? Question for you. Okay, let's see if that's right. I have a question for you. Okay, let's look at the next one. What is that? Semicolon and an S. No, not a smiley face. Anybody want to take a guess? All right, let's go. Let's see what the answer is. It's a gentle warning. What did you say? That's what it means. It's like, it's almost like a, it's, it's a defensive thing. It's like, I can't believe you said what you said. What did you say to me? That kind of thing, okay? All right, what about this? Love. Love? <laughs> All right, let's see, what, let's see what the next one is. All right, let's see what the answer is. It is love, it's kind of chopped off, friendship or a broken heart, okay? So your team, if you see that posted on Facebook or a text message, it could either mean love, friendship, or it could mean a broken heart, all right? Let's go to the next one. What about this? Anybody? All right. Huh? What'd you say? 32. 32, no. Let's look at the answer. A heart of love... The more threes means it's a bigger heart. It's like more love. Okay? All right. Now, next. What does this mean? What would you say? That's it. Let's see what the answer is. My or your two cents worth. Okay? This is that little game in the, uh, in the paper on Sunday. You know, that's got the little... Uh, you know what I'm talking about? The little sponsor. Yeah. Nobody reads the paper anymore, she said. <laughs> Me and Eric. <laughs> okay. Uh, by the way, did you know that there are there are 1,403 of these ways to communicate through text messaging? Uh, I promise you, you can Google it. As a matter of fact, if you guys, if you're ever, if you're ever curious about what your kids are saying, if you will go into go on to uh, Webipedia slash text messaging online chat abbreviations. 1,403 abbreviations you'll find, okay? So if you ever want to decipher something, that's the way to go. Okay, uh, next one. What does this mean? It's not 143. What? Anybody know? 
Huh? I'll see what it says. How about that? I love you. All right, what about this? I love you too. There you go. I can't see the two over here. All right? What about this? I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Okay? All right, what about this one? Too much information. Too much information. All right? What about this one? Huh? Anybody want to guess? What'd you say? Huh? Let's get high. That's what that means. Chop it off. Alright? So, hey, guys, if you see your kids, ladies, if you see your kids put 4 2 on something, you better be knocking down the door and find out what's going on, okay? Alright, what about this? Huh? Parent is watching. That's code nine. If your kids put nine on a text message or on Facebook, it's like can't talk, parents are watching. Okay? Number nine. All right, what about this? What? Boyfriend. Boyfriend. All right, what about this? Huh? Parents are watching. Parent is watching. All right, that's it. Okay, now, if, I'm telling you, if you guys, if you want to get, get, if you want to get up on this, Hey, listen, I'm telling you guys, you need to be involved in your kids' lives. If it means learning what this stuff means so that you can kind of keep a check, hey, do it. Okay? Um, Brother Mike? What's that? <laughs> All right. Um, um, well, what, what I would say is this. If you see signs like this that you think, okay, I don't know what that means, hey, I would look it up, especially if you have concern. If you see behavior, habits, and that kind of thing that are not characteristic of your kids, folks, check up on them. I mean, check out these things because you want to know, what, you want to know what's going on in your kids' lives. Um, all right. Uh, the, there are several lies about media that I want to talk to you, and then we're going to finish tonight. I'm not sure what time it is. There are so many things I wanted to share. Okay, we got all the time. Um, there, there are, um, there's a book that calls, it's called Lies Young Women Believe. Okay? And in this book, it talks about media. It talks about young women and the, and the media stuff, uh, about conversations um, that were revealed, um, you know, as a result to young teenage women. And it referred to media. And I want to kind of share this with you. Uh, there are several lies that the media, that young teenage girls are believing today. Number one is this. The benefits of, con of constant media outweigh the harm. This was one of the most universal believed lies. Almost every young woman we spoke to, 98%, almost every young woman that they spoke to agreed that their media habits negatively affect their relationship with God and others, but they believe the benefits are worth it. What kind of benefits? Number one, Facebook connects me to my friends. So even though it's taking time away from God, then it's okay because it's helping me connect with my friends. That's a lot. Number two, I usually put on music when I want to quit thinking those are the benefits. I want to put on music, or I usually put on music when I want to quit thinking. Folks, that's one of the reasons I believe that young people particularly, um, there, there's no quietness, there's no quiet time in their life. There's no time to focus quietly on God. And so, also, it says, I see a pretty girl on TV or on YouTube, and she dresses a certain way, and I know that's what's in style, so it pretty much keeps me up in fashion. Need we go on? The girls themselves admit that some of the benefits were pretty shallow and they could not seem to change their media habits. If you think you're immune to behavior changes, or I'm sorry, to behavior changes influenced by our media choices, think again. Horror novelist Stephen King, some of you know him, once said, movies are the highest popular art of our time and art has the ability to change lives. And folks, many times it's changing them negatively, not for God, but away from God. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. Media sources, I believe, can be a benefit, and I think we can use them to be a benefit, but we've got to be very careful about that, okay? Um, let's see. 
We're not immune from buying what they want us to buy, dressing how they want us to dress, and valuing what they want us to value. If you're taking in regular or significant doses of music, television, internet, movies, you are being affected by them. The question is, are you being influenced positively or negatively? The impact usually is not felt immediately. It's more like an IV you put in your arm that goes drip, 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 gradually pumping a foreign substance into your system. If the substance dripping through that plastic tube is toxic or poisonous, you may not feel the result right away, but once it gets into your system, your whole body will definitely be affected. Here's another lie. It's not a waste of time, even if it's even if it is, it's okay. A lot of the girls that we spoke to uh, estimated that they spend 25 to 35 hours a week online, text messaging and with their iPod or whatever it is the technology you're using. Um, uh, we found it interesting that girls who were homeschooled were likely to have the highest number of hours uh, doing that. Many felt that this was absolutely fine. Here are some of their arguments. Parents are just not used to it. I hate it when they get mad and they're, they're like, get off now. Uh, it's how my generation communicates. Number two, it's how I stay connected to my friends. That's a big, huge thing right there. And then uh, research proves that, this is something teenagers will say, research proves that you can learn a lot of high-end, high-hand-eye coordination from computer games. By the way, as far as we know it, no great athlete careers have ever been built on, on hand-eye coordination learned from computer games, okay? Uh, anyway, all right. You see where I'm going with this. Folks, we've gotta be careful, not about just young ladies, but about our young men too. Uh, be careful about what media does in their lives. You know what the Bible tells us? The Bible says this. Uh, David said in Psalm, uh, where was that? Uh, David said this in Psalm 119, I believe verse 11. He said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Now, am I saying that all media is bad? No, I'm not. There's a lot of good things that can come out of it. But I'm telling you, when your kids are spending 25 and 35 hours a week on media outlets, that's taking away time that they can spend reading God's word. By the way, if they've got their iPod or whatever they're listening to, they can listen to the word of God. You know, listen, when I go down the interstate, sometimes I take my phone, which I have media stuff too, and I go to my Bible app, and I click on and let it read the Bible to me. Because there are a lot of good things that they can use uh, with technology. And so technology is not all bad, but it's, it's, the, it's the way that we use it. And it's important that we understand where our kids are, that we understand what they're listening to, what they're watching, because ultimately, guys, we're responsible before God for raising our children to know Him and to love Him. Now, can you think about it one day if you kind of let your kids go and let them do exactly what they want to do and anything they want to do, doesn't matter what it is, you know, it's a free-for-all, and one day your child never comes to know the Lord and you go up in heaven and part of your family is not there because you didn't do the job that you did or I didn't do the job that I was supposed to do before God. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We have a job to do, and it is to raise our children to know the Lord. Train up a child in the way he should go. Tell them about the Lord. Not just tell them, but live it out in your life. You know, it's, it's one thing for a parent to say, okay, you can only spend such and such time in this media outlet, but that doesn't, that's not, that doesn't apply to me. I'm going to do what I want to do. You need to show your kids. You need to show them discipline. Show them, hey, I love God, and because I love God, hey, I might spend a little bit of time on this, but I'm also going to spend time reading my Bible and praying and seeking God's face. Our kids need to see that in our lives. Your grandkids, some of you got grandkids, your grandkids need to see that in their life. And for some of you guys that have yet to have kids, you guys, you know, this is important for you too. Because one day, if God blesses you, you're going to have kids, and you've got to know how to train them up for the Lord. You've got to understand the guidelines that you need to set for your children. And so it's important for all of us. And so may, may God help us, um, you know, to, to take some of these things in consideration and to, to do the things that God wants us to do as it pertains to our families, okay? Uh, and even to us personally. Because some of this stuff I talked about, it affects us as well. And it's important that we follow what God would want us to do uh, in our lives and in our kids' lives or families' lives. So let's pray. For the mic, would you dismiss us at least tonight? Lord, we thank you for the privilege of not being here tonight.